Good morning, church. It's so good to be together online today. Let's get ready to worship. People come together, strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Oh, I'm 
have in common if you were to follow social media and if you were to watch the news you would think right now that we don't have much in common you would be under the understanding that we're all divided on every issue because sometimes the people at the extreme sides of the issue are yelling the loudest but I really believe at the end of the day we have far more in common than we do not like the hurts and the pains of this life are common. The fact that we're all faulted and broken and don't have a full understanding of everything in front of us, I think we have in common. You know another thing I think we have in common? I think that whether you're a believer in Christ or whether you have been far from God or you don't even believe there's a God, most of us have in common that at some time or the other we've prayed. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home and you were taught some prayers. Maybe, just maybe, you smashed your thumb in your garage and you go straight past cussing and straight to calling out the name of God. Maybe real pain is determined in the moment not where we're hurt bad enough to cuss, but the moment where we're hurt bad enough to pray. And most of us have prayed. Over the years in my ministry, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a room with somebody who was not yet a believer in Jesus, and most of the time they were not offended when I offered to pray with them or for them. I learned how to pray as a kid in the way that many people were taught to pray in the church, and, and I think these were well-meaning attempts to teach prayer, but in reality, uh, what they do is they create habits, and habits are good. It's a good habit to be in conversation, and it's a good thing. You know, before meals, I was taught to pray, and I tend to pray, God is good, God is great, now thank you for our food. And it's a habitual prayer, and it got to the spot where you didn't think about it much. It just kind of is what came out, and we 
prayed this prayer before I went to bed. And we said, now I lay me down to sleep. If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. <laughs> what, a, what a dark prayer. And then we, we, we teach those prayers, and then we wonder why kids wake us up in the middle of the night having nightmares and pee the bed. We pray those prayers, and oftentimes we pray these prayers. We're taught to pray, oh, I want this in life, and our, we're taught to pray for that thing. As if God is our cosmic Coke machine, and somehow if I pray to God, I change God. But the reality is... Oftentimes, prayer was not really given to us to so much change God, but it often can change us. I've been praying a prayer for the last few days. Now, it kind of comes out of the fact that I'm finding some people's voices to be overwhelmingly loud in our culture. And I often find loudness as annoying. And it's pretty easy after we see something as annoying to then begin to feel bitter toward it. And so in my own battle to not get bitter at all the noise on every side of every public argument and every public news situation, I begin to feel a little bit of bitterness set in toward people. I know this, in my own life, I've allowed bitterness to settle in a few times. It doesn't end well. Right now, you might be stuck in a moment where you're feeling bitter towards people, maybe towards an entire people. Maybe you're feeling bitter at individuals in your life, but I can tell you it, bitterness often is a drink that poisons our soul. And I know from experience, it's not a place that I can live well. So I've been praying this prayer, and, and I have to tell you, this prayer is messing with me. See, all of a sudden, when I start praying this prayer, I start seeing people differently. I start wanting to understand how people get to some of the assumptions they get to. I believe if you'll begin to pray this prayer, it might revolutionize your walk of faith with Jesus. I believe it might begin to revolutionize some of your relationships in your life, and I believe it might begin to help us to move away from a place of division to a place of deeper connection in our culture. And the prayer I've been praying is, Jesus, teach me to see people as you see people. Notice I didn't say, Jesus, please take the side in the argument that I want you to take and show that I'm your favorite. The prayer is, teach me. Not, Jesus, let me teach you. The prayer is, teach me to see people as you see people. Now, in John, the book of John, the account of Jesus by John, John says in chapter 316, for God so loved the world, meaning God so loved humanity that he gave his son to die on the cross. That God so loved the world that he was moved to love broken, messed up people who were nothing like him. Because God was holy and righteous, Jesus was holy and righteous, and he came and walked in the midst of real people. Real people who had false ideas about who he was. Real people who had uh, false ideas about others. Real people who were broken and messed up. People who thought they had it together but were messed up. People who knew they were broken and messed up. And Jesus came to give his life so that all of those people could no longer have to hide their brokenness, but be in a relationship with God where he taught us to see others as he sees them. There's a story in scripture called the Good Samaritan. It's one of my favorite stories. The very title that we've given this passage 
would have been very unlikely in Jesus' day to have been a part of a storybook amongst God's people. See, Samaritans were considered dirty and unclean, messed up, jacked up, not presentable to God. But Jesus tells a story, and in Luke, the writer of Luke begins to tell a story in chapter 10, verse 25 through 29. By the way, if you're looking for some scripture to read, I would encourage you to be reading the book of Luke. On one occasion, it says, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, in Jesus' day, the experts in the law had to, to know the entire first five books of Scripture. They had to know all the rules, all the laws. They had to, they had to know them well. They had to, to have a full mastery of them. And they would be tested by other teachers in the law to even be allowed to teach. But one of these experts in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now here we have, they don't know what we now know. Jesus is the son of God. He's going to die on the cross for the forgiveness of sin so that men might be restored to him. But the experts in the law were used to trying to show and justify that they somehow had earned forgiveness. But the expert in the law stands up to test Jesus. Perhaps it's a twist of how things should have been. And perhaps it's not that much different as when we pray to God telling him how to act. But he asks this question of Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's trying to get Jesus in trouble. He's trying to somehow say, well, Jesus gave this answer, but that's not what it says. And Jesus does what he often does. He often frustrates the teachers of the law because rather than giving them a point blank answer, he either tells them a story or he asks them a question. So often it's the question that God asks us, not the question that we ask God that transforms us. He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Ironic that the one in whom the law was about, in the one whom the law was directed for, Jesus asked him the question. And the man says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He gives the right answer. He knows the right answer to the question. He passed the quiz. He passed the test. Jesus says, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Notice, Jesus tells him he answered the question correctly. But then he says, do this and you will live. And the deeper thing that can be pointed out here that Jesus is trying to teach the man is that, yes, you can know the answer, but act ungodly. But the man wanted to justify himself. So we ask Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You see, this man had had some accomplishments to be in the place that he was. He mastered that law and he knew it. And it's really dangerous because sometimes when we accomplish a thing or two in life, it can lead us to a level of arrogance. And it's very arrogant that the man is asking Jesus these questions as if he's testing Jesus. Have you ever noticed that when things go well or we get to a good place in life, we love to claim it? Like when we win the title, we love to say we worked so hard. We played good defense. We did this. And when things don't go well for others or ourselves, we like to blame it. Well, this thing happened to me. And when they don't go well for others, we often like to say, well, if they had done better, this story of the Good Samaritan is a story in which a man goes into the bad part of town. It says, in reply, Jesus begins to tell the story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, Jerusalem was high on a hill and Jer Jericho was down lower. In order to get from Jerusalem to Jericho on the road, and we don't know why the man was on the road, he was attacked by robbers. He gets to the low area, which would have been a place where he would have been susceptible to be robbed. 
It says they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. For some of you, that may be what you feel has happened to you in your life. And maybe you know why you were in the place, in the situation where it happened to you, but for many of you, maybe it didn't have anything to do with you. Maybe it was a situation that unbeknownst to you, you walked into. But here's what I know. When you are beaten and half dead, understanding is hard to come by. And even if you caused some of your pain by where you were, it doesn't heal you. And even if you didn't have anything to do with it, it still hurts. We like to say things to oversimplify situations. We read a news story and we say, well, that person shouldn't have been there. Maybe we say things like, guess they had it coming. Maybe they learned their lesson. You know what I've found over the years? It is so oversimplified to say these little phrases and in reality, we often say these phrases to remove discomfort from ourselves. We try to oversimplify very complex things in order to justify our feelings. Well, that man lying dead on the ground, you know, he shouldn't have gone along that road. Doesn't he know you don't travel that road? But you're going to see in a minute other people traveled that road. Oh, I, I guess maybe, uh, maybe he had it coming. Maybe... Maybe he shouldn't have been on that road. Maybe we think he should have been on another road. But what we know is there was really only one major way from Jerusalem to Jericho. You know, context matters. If I told you this morning that there was a story of a man who was shot out in the back of a strip club last night trying to force a woman into the car, we would say things like he shouldn't have been there. I guess he had it coming. Maybe he learned his lesson. But if we understand that for years he had been trying to find his daughter and had found her there and tried to help her escape the sex trade, we would find out that context matters a lot. And one of our guttural responses to social media and people's opinions and all of this are that we often find it easier to give a phrase than to give of our life to understand where other people are coming from and context matters see the man was beaten knocked down and then it goes to tell us a priest and the jewish people would have said okay you know we gave simple answers as in our mind about the, why this man got beat that's a place where people get robbed and then you hear the story about the the priest and it says the priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man he passed by on the other side. You know, the road to becoming a priest was an interesting road. The priest would have been very godly. He would have understood, very, he would have been very religious, I should say. He would have known all of the religious rituals and habits in his culture. He would have known all the right things to say and do. He would have been able to determine this is good, this is bad, this is clean, this is unclean, this is within the rules, this is outside of the rules. See, the priest could have laid a lot of judgment on people. One thing we seem to fail to notice here was that if that man hadn't gone ahead of the priest, it might have been the priest who got robbed. And it's really easy when you're in a habit of being religious and you're in a habit of knowing all the religious rules and knowing all the, the legalism and all of that stuff. It's real easy to neglect the fact that something brought you to the point where you're at. That if you happen to know the ways of God, that's a blessing. If you happen to uh, know the ways and, and the, the rules and know the way to do the right thing and the wrong thing, that's a blessing. But not everyone has walked the road that led them there. There's a difference between being religious and godly, though. For far too long, we've rewarded the people who have a bunch of religious habits and behaviors. We say things at their funerals like, 
He was a good, God-fearing man. When in reality, what we're saying is from the outward appearance, he seemed to have done good things. The priest, by all means, would have seemed to have done good things, right things, religious things. But when he is presented the problem of a man beaten and half dead alongside the road, he steps around on the other side. I don't know, maybe he began to say things like, I just, I took a bath today, so I was clean by my standards. Oh, he's a Samaritan, I, I can't touch him because he's considered unclean and I'm considered clean. Maybe at his best, he said, you know what? I, oh, look at that poor guy over there. I'll pray for him. You know, prayer does not excuse us from helping. I hear people say that all the time. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. The priest went around and he just went about his business. Likely went about his religious life. And just moved on. He by all means religiously stayed clean. But there's a difference in being religious and being godly. And oftentimes people need our presence more than our prayers. If you're flat on your back half dead and someone looks at you and says, oh, so sorry. I'll pray for you. Would you rather have a hand to help you up? Here's my question. If God calls us to pray about it, he often calls us to do something about it. People often need our presence more than our prayers. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in funeral lines and listened to people say the dumbest crap. All because they want their discomfort with the death to go away while the grieving person is struggling for every single second. I can't tell you how often I've been around religious people and heard them want to explain away the problem that they see. People often need our presence more than our prayers. It says, then, so too, a Levite. And the Jewish people, when they heard about the priest, they would have had a positive attitude. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the good a uh, religious priest, and now they hear about the Levite, and the Levite was always in the temple, keeping the temple clean. Like he was inside the building, he was doing the, the religious thing, he was behaving the way he was supposed to, and it says when he came to the place, he saw him pass by on the other side. The Levite was kind of one of those people that maybe was so heavenly minded they were of no earthly good. You know, the person that throws the flowery, bless you on everything they say. Sometimes we feel those temptations to say things like, God bless you. Maybe God wants to bless them through you. When I was in college and I decided that God was wanting to do some things in my life and I needed to make some changes. Some people like this almost cost me to walk away from my faith. See, I, I thought if I find some good religious people, if I find some people that go to chapel, that go to prayer group, that go to a, a small group, then surely that'll help me make the change. But I remember the morning when one, of, when one of my best friends died. And I went to find those people. And their response was, oh, oh it's, it was a Sunday morning. We, we, we're going to go to church. Their responses was, well, the thing that caused your, bro your buddy to die, it was a bad thing. It sh just shouldn't, that's bad. So then I wandered back to my dorm room where I found my 250-pound lineman neighbor who was still in his room asleep from the night before, and I called him by name, and I said, my buddy got killed. He was in his own mess in life, but he got up and wrapped me up in a hug, and he sat there with me until I could get a hold of the people that I needed to get a hold of. 
See, I almost walked away because the people that I met who had been broken and understood brokenness seemed to love me more in my brokenness. I want you to know that you might be the priest, you might be the Levite, you might look religious, and you might look clean. But if we are going to love like Jesus, we have to be willing in the middle of our own mess to get elbows deep with others in their mess because that will change the world. When we begin to look at people and not try to oversimplify their situation and explain it away so we feel more comfortable, but to go elbows deep into their mess while we're in ours, maybe then, maybe then the world will begin to change. See, these are the people that go into restaurants on Sunday after worshiping a holy and righteous God who gave them grace and forgiveness when they did not deserve it. And have no grace when the waitress forgets their butter. I'm telling you, some of you would do more good for the kingdom of God if you would just tip your waitress. See, if you pray this prayer, God, teach me to see how others, as you see them, maybe you won't see the server that forgot your butter. Maybe you'll see the single mom who's trying to make it and missing a weekend with her kids. Maybe if we see the person who we want to call an idiot driving around town. Instead of saying, what an idiot, they're stupid, they're not paying attention, they don't care about anybody else. Maybe we might begin to see the college student who's just trying to balance everything for the first time in life. Maybe we run into that person that we know and we think they should stop and talk to us in the store, that unfriendly woman who just doesn't talk to you when you try to approach her maybe rather than trying to explain well she's unfriendly or she's just a bad person or she doesn't like everybody maybe you might see the woman who is dying to get home to nurse her baby but had to enter into a grocery store because no one else could go for her maybe we'll stop saying things to people while they're down and out and struggling like you'll get over it Maybe we'll stop saying dumb things like, just be positive. Just be positive. The man in the story who Jesus is talking about, he didn't have much to be positive about. He was trying to get somewhere. He clearly wasn't going to get there. He had some stuff, but now he doesn't have some stuff. A life circumstance happened to him that he wasn't planning on or counting on. And now he's flat on his back, half dead. Positivity may make your mindset better, but it will not fix your situation. The person was probably trying to be positive when he tried to get up and found out his legs wouldn't work. The person was probably trying to be positive when after the beating, he licked his own blood and sweat and off of his face and tried to see clearly and couldn't. When people say things like, see the good in everything, it's hard to see the good when your face is stuck in the dirt because you've been beaten and left for dead. And then there's things we say that they're right, but they're really not helpful. I mean, the truth is, on the backside of things in life, when we get through what we're going through, it's easy to look back and say, God works for all things for good. But when you've lost what you've had, when your world's been interrupted, and someone says God works all things for good, it's kind of hard to see. You know, what's funny is he didn't need the man's prayers. He needed somebody's presence. And there's this guy that walks along called a Samaritan. And when Jesus said, but a Samaritan, this is when the whole crowd around Jesus would have gasped. This is when the man who was the expert in the law would have been, oh my, a Samaritan. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. He didn't cross the road. You know what? He didn't stand across the road and say, you should come to me. Because when you're beat down and tore up and busted up, and half dead sometimes you don't just need words sometimes you need help and when he saw him he took pity on him see a lot of people like to give pity we say things like this in the south they say this one bless your heart 
that's a simple response to say to somebody when you're like, oh, you want to say something nice to them, but you kind of want to be like, you're so stupid. You know the last thing that someone needs when they're beat down and beat up was to be told you're stupid. But he took pity on them. See, pity is readily available, but the man didn't just need pity. He needed presence. He didn't just need pity, but he needed investment of someone else. His legs didn't work. There were four legs that went by that didn't help. But when it comes to the Samaritan, who everyone else seemed that was unclean and not okay, the Samaritan somehow has pity, and he goes to him and bandaged his wounds. We should be propelled forward. If you can recognize that you have needed grace and been given it, you should be propelled forward, not pushed to the side. And he bandaged his wounds. Pouring on oil and wine. I don't know what the Samaritan had his oil and wine on him for. But my guess is he had plans for it. But when he saw a broken man in the road, he began to see the man as needing them worse than himself. So he puts the man on his own donkey. Do you notice this? If you have a donkey and you're riding the donkey and you give, you put another man on your donkey, you probably are going to walk. He says he took him to an inn and he took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. See, he didn't just make sure that that situation got better right then. He continued to invest in the situation. He gives them to the innkeeper and he says, look after him. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. You know, the Samaritan was the only one willing to get messy and dirty. I mean, got blood on his hands, maybe, from picking the man up. Got hot and sweaty on the direction, the place that he was going, before he got to the place he was going. He may have gotten there and some people looked at him and said, where have you been that you're so dirty? See, too many Christians are worried that you're going to be guilty by association when you walk into someone else's mess. See, if you don't have friends and people in your life who you're investing in who are broken, jacked up, and messed up, you probably don't look much like Jesus. Because the scripture tells us that Jesus came in the world to save the world, not to condemn it. That Jesus came into the world to associate with broken, messed up, jacked up men while he was the holiness of God. The people who look nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. Because Jesus was willing to step across boundaries. Jesus was willing to step into lives. The other people walked around. Jesus was willing to walk in. goes on in verse 36 to say, which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? Jesus puts the question back on the plate of the teacher, uh, expert in the law. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. But see, the expert in the law couldn't even say the Samaritan man. Because he had hate in his heart for another man whose situation he didn't understand. I'm here to tell you that if you, red, yellow, black, or white, can look across the aisle at someone who's different than you, and harbor hate in your heart, you will miss what Jesus is doing, period. The one who had mercy on him, he says, and Jesus then looks at the man and says, go and do likewise. And the hard question that the man had to have probably asked in this moment is, am I willing to get messy, dirty, and look unclean? Jesus seems to be far less concerned about what the outward appearance is and what the inner soul chooses to do.
Can we pray that prayer? But seriously, you think this is where the message ends up. Oh yeah, a preacher talked about loving people. What I talked about is the transforming work I believe that God wants to do in your and my heart. Where we learn to see people as he sees people. That while we were still broken, while we were half dead, he was willing to come to us to offer us healing and forgiveness and to walk with us as we move forward in his will Jesus was willing to come to you and I. So how can we, in seeing the plight and the hurt in our world of brokenness all around us, you don't have to look all the way across the world to see brokenness. Brokenness is probably in your kid's bedroom. Brokenness is probably in your kitchen. Brokenness is probably at your workplace. Brokenness is certainly in our community. We, as a people who know what Jesus did in the midst of our brokenness, won't reach out across to other folks, go into the mess, into the mess, and love others like Jesus loves them. We will miss so much. So will you pray, Jesus, teach me to see people as you see people. Jesus, help me not to see the man beaten on the ground. Jesus, help me to see a soul whose mama loved him. Just help me to see him as a kid who you have great plans for. God, help me to see the broken and beat up addict as a, your child who you dearly love. God, help me to see the poor and the broken, the orphan and the widow. Help me to see them as your kid with great purpose who you love. Jesus, teach us to see people as you see people. I was going to end my message there, but it kept weighing on my heart because I think that there's a missing piece here. Yes, we need to pray that prayer every single day. God, help me to see the person in the checkout line, the person I work with, the person driving in front of me and behind me, like you see them. But the problem is, so many of us have a twisted version of how God sees us. Because we view God as some angry God ready to strike us down and steal us out of our bed in the middle of the night. Rather than a God who has a good plan for us. Rather than a God, we see a God who might be mad at us from our bad performance. But God looked at us while we were still sinners, Scripture said. While we were still performing badly. And he sent his son to pay a price so we could be in relationship with him. God valued us. Enough to give what he had of greatest value in his son. That's true about you. Maybe you received Jesus as a young kid and you kind of forgot that. That part about being broken because all you've known is following Jesus, doing religious things. Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. But Jesus Christ offers us forgiveness. You were once dead. And through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you've been given eternal life. And because of that, you don't fear the consequences of today because you know the best is yet to come. How does Jesus see you? Yes, you. I'm sure some people have turned this off by now. They did their church duty. They watched their church video thingy. But we don't go to church. We are the church. And if you're watching, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And he wants to propel you forward in the power of his love to make a difference in the world. And that difference is not just Sunday morning church attendance. It's seeing the people around you as children of God who are loved. We can change the world if we're in a building or, or watching on video because when we go from here, it's not just about the rules of things we do. It's about what God has done in our life. And we can help others see Jesus who are nothing like Jesus.
because once we were nothing like Jesus. You don't have to fake it here. Bethel, we as a collective church are going to pray this prayer. The change starts with you and I and this church asking God to give us a passion for other people, a heart for other people, to not oversimplify everyone else and explain away all the problems around us. God doesn't need you to explain what he already understands. God is propelling us to be a people who go deeper and see others as he sees them. This morning, if you're listening, you might be saying, well, what do I have to do to be loved by God? All you have to do is acknowledge he already has loved you. All you have to do is to be willing to acknowledge that even though you've been knocked down on the ground, that you know he has the power and the ability to propel you in a life of love by offering you forgiveness. And then we need to be a people who go and do likewise. We bow your heads in prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you. For this day, for this church, for this message, God, I pray for the time that we're in, God, that we wouldn't just be a people who do religious things and follow religious rules, but we would be people who see others as you see them and love them as you love them. Lord, continue to strengthen us and show us how you love others, to help us to see people the way you see them. Help us to grow, help us to be a people who Uh, aren't looking for opportunities to stay clean and out of the mess, but a group of people who are willing to get in the mess so that more people may know you. In Jesus' name I pray.
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment, if you haven't already, to go to your app store and search Bethel Putco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages. You can view the messages from Sunday morning. And you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved.